From French film to French philosophy, or at least one of the best known of their modern philosophers, Roland Barthes. More than 30 years after his death, Barthes' writing on literature, culture and language remains both original and influential. Image, music, text, mythologies and the death of the author are key works of modern philosophy and we may have him to thank, or not, for the use of the word text as something of a hold-all for all writing, whether novel, story, poem or play, the text as the thing. A fascinating and deeply personal reading of Barth's own texts can be found in issue 41 of the Dublin Review. Writer Brian Dillon traces his own first encounters with the work and ideas of the Frenchman and its abiding interest and influence for him. Uh, Brian Dillon, why is Barth such a significant figure still? And uh, tell me as well something about those key works of his. Well, the key books, the the first really important book of of Barth's um, comes in the early 1950s. It's a book called Mythologies, and that's really a series of very short essays in which he takes apart in a very delicate but kind of audacious way various aspects of popular culture. So he writes about press photographs, he writes about TV advertising, he writes an extraordinary essay on striptease in which he argues that the whole point of striptease is actually to veil the body at the very last moment. And his, his project there is really to kind of strip away and to reveal the codes and structures um, by which culture in general operates. And he bases a lot of this on his study in the 1940s um, of the work of Ferdinand de Saussure, the great Swiss linguist. And a lot of what a lot of Barthes' ideas come out of linguistics. He sees the world, at, at least at this point in his career, he sees the whole world structured like a language. And he thinks that the role of the critic really is to, is to show how these structures operate and what they're trying to hide, essentially. So Mythologies is the first really great, important work, I think. Um, then his, I suppose, his influence as as a thinker, as a writer. How how important is he in, I suppose, in the shaping of um, of that strange canon of theory with the capital T, which you which you write about in that essay. He's he's absolutely at the heart of that. I mean, in 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 an English speaking context, in a sense, he's he's almost the kind of progenitor uh, of of that whole movement that takes place in, in the, the States from the, the early 70s onwards and in the UK and in Ireland, I guess, from the, the, the mid-80s onwards. And Bart is the first kind of really great thinker of that generation who's, who's taken up by critics and by academics uh, in an, an Anglophone context. And I suppose the key text there would be an essay that he published in a very small art magazine in the States in 1967, notorious essay called The Death of the Author, in which he argues that we need to rid ourselves of the idea of authorship, not to rid ourselves of authors. A lot of people misread this essay and think that he's simply saying authors don't matter or they somehow don't exist in some ridiculous way. The argument is that instead of reading a work of literature always with the idea of the author's intention in our minds, what we should focus on much more is the the rather playful and almost erotic, an idea he comes back late to later, relationship between the reader and the language itself. So reading becomes for him in that in that essay, um, he describes it very simply and ver- but very beautifully as like going for a walk in the country. You know, he says it, it's it's a kind of vagrant, wandering, uh, curious kind of experience. And it's not you're reading not with the sense that there's all, there's some kind of solid core of intention behind uh, a poem or or a novel or a short story. You're exploring it for yourself, um, and that I think is a very seductive idea for many uh, academics in that period. Do we really have him <laughs> to thank, or maybe not thank, for that replacement of the word novel or story or song or poem? or book indeed, with the rather po-faced word text? Well, we, well, we do. We do in the sense that he's uh, the first French critic who's, who's imported into uh, the English-speaking uh, university who uses that word. The thing to, I, think, I guess, you know, that, that word has become terribly hackneyed um, and has been drained of much of its uh, significance. If you go back to Bart and, and read the, the, the essays where he first starts to kind of formulate his idea of the text, it's actually a much, much richer word because it's about text. Texture. And it's about, you know, he compares writing to textiles. To, he's, he's really interested in the surface of language and in the, the sensuality of language. And I think the, the way that that term was subsequently kind of bandied, bandied around um, in what became theory with a capital T has lost a lot of that sense uh, of pleasure, actually, um, which is really, in a sense, what, what Bart means by that word.
How did you make that journey towards the pleasure of language uh, through your encounter as a as a teenager um, with with this work, which was so much, especially the early work, is say, uh, about theory, about notions of of philosophy, um, about I suppose the abstruse in a sense. But you managed to again make that journey, as Barth himself seems to have done, uh, towards refinding, uh, you know, the sensual, the beauty in in writing. Well, my my first encounter with Barth was was kind of, was second hand actually. I mean, I'm 41, and a lot of people of my generation would have would have learned about thinkers and writers like Barth in the pages of of British music magazines uh, in the early 80s. And so I'd heard this name, I'd seen this name kind of bandied around. And one afternoon in Rathmines Library, I happened on a copy of uh, Image Music Text, which is a collection of Barth's essays from the 60s and 70s. And it's about literature and theatre and photography and cinema, all kinds of subjects. And I was just absolutely transfixed by it. I mean, I have to say that I had no idea what he was talking about. I was I was 15 at the time. But it something about it kind of uh, grabbed me. And a year later, I went back to it. Uh, in the meantime, my mother had died. And uh, I spent many, many solitary hours uh, in Rathmines Library poring over um, bits of French literature and bits of, you know, and American uh, fiction, post-war fiction, the beats and so on. But the person who really kind of sort of sucked me in really was uh, was Bart. And it was partly the ideas, it was partly that idea that I, that I mentioned earlier in, with mythologies of seeing through popular culture, of, of revealing the codes by which we all lived our, our daily lives. But it was also to do with language, I think. And one of the things that, that I was kind of absolutely thrilled by at the time was the texture of Bart's own writing which has sometimes got a kind of reputation for being very forbidding and difficult but actually his, his sentences are so beautiful and this, this, this prose that's so full of little excursions and digressions and parentheses and dashes and italics and so on I found absolutely thrilling and it was the reason, Bart was the reason that book it really was the reason that I went on then to, to university to study English literature in, in the first place. You say in another piece that uh, Bart was a great believer in discretion and tact, and he certainly did not believe in any virtue attached to frankness in writing. I wonder if that's true. I think he. I think he's, he was a writer who shuttled back and forth, really, between a kind of reserve and a kind of confessionalism. So later on, you know, his books become very personal. At the same time, they don't reveal certain details. So Bart was gay, for example. And late in his life, um, in 1977, he wrote a book called A Lover's Discourse, which is all about... Um, the the kind of images and 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 structures of language and thought that we surround ourselves with when we're in love, even just like the the, the sentence "I love you," you know, is filled with so much prior significance that comes from our, our understanding of literature and cinema and so on. Um, so it's a book about the language of love, but it's also a book about being uh, a middle-aged gay man in in Paris in the mid 1970s. But he never, or he very rarely, he kind of glances off the fact that it's actually a book about himself and about his own love. Um, so in that sense, he's he's reserved. But his work moves in that period towards the end of his life. He died in 1980, towards a much more confessional mode, I think. And that's that's one of the things that I find so exciting about him is is that that shuttling back and forth between something quite forbidding and intellectual and 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 rigorous and austere. And this move slowly in his late career towards almost a kind of sentimentality. You know, he ends up he ends up being, in a way, the sort of the late twentieth century Proust. Although you know, he wrote he wrote only very very short books, unlike Proust. And I suppose, like Proust, uh, was extremely close to his mother. Tell me a little more about his personal life. Bart. Well, he was born in nineteen fifteen, and uh, his father uh, died in the First World War. Um, his father died very shortly after after Bart was was born, and he lived most of his life with his mother. He studied at the Sorbonne. Um, in his twenties, he contracted TB, and he spent uh, a number of years in a sanatorium, which he he thought about in a way as his his second university. And when he emerged from that, a lot of his his academic ambition had been not exactly he didn't exactly falter, but he'd been slowed down in 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 the possibilities for for an academic career, and so he taught. Uh, in various bits of, of France, he taught in, in uh, North Africa. He didn't really attain a kind of um, academic authority until very late in, in his career. 
But he lived with his mother in Paris. Once he was he was teaching uh, in, in Paris, they lived uh, together in the same apartment. She, I think, was upstairs and he downstairs. And the, the story is told um, that his mother never acknowledged the fact uh, that he was gay. But he became, you know, in from the ni- mid-60s onwards, he became internationally extremely famous and taught in the United States, um, became part of you know, that, that kind of movement of theory that you mentioned earlier, became kind of star turn uh, in that, but maintained this, this strange kind of uh, domestic, almost conjugal relationship with his mother until she died in 77. Brian, I want to talk to you a little more about your connection uh, to Barton and his influence on you. And, and this um, something you said in, in a piece you wrote uh, where you said that uh, Ronan Barth saved my life and you, you go on to qualify that. But um, before we talk a little more about all of that, maybe you'd read us um, something from the essay in the Dublin Review. If David Bowie invented my adolescent I, and I thought this at the time, falling hard for his often stated belief that the self was a thing concocted from one's influences, it was Bart who nourished my fantasies about who or what I wanted to be as an adult. Image music text was an introduction to ways of thinking, looking and reading that would more or less determine what I did with my life for the next decade and a half. I've forgotten now who originated the cliché that says nobody nurses youthful ambitions to be a critic, but that was where I set my sights. Bart seemed to cast all the writers I loved into a new light, from the post-punk hipsters at the NME to the wild of the critic as artist and the disappointed aesthete Cyril Connolly, whose enemies of promise I found in my father's bookcase. All these figures, and I knew there were others as yet unread, like Susan Sontag, Kenneth Tynan, John Berger and Gore Vidal, seemed to inhabit some glamorous space between hard thinking and real unstuffy celebrity. I still had the vaguest sense of how one got to that place, Sometime in my last year at school, when suddenly choices had to be made, I suggested to my father that I might like to be a journalist, but he looked at me over his Irish Times and told me the whole profession was a racket. You go on from there to to write about um, doing this disastrous leaving cert, Um, but you made it to college in the end, you made it to UCD, and it's striking in the essay how your official education and your personal education were on completely different tracks in secondary school. You, you, you say, I'm always amazed to meet interesting, creative or successful people who excelled at school. Did things change for you at all in, in college? Did the different tracks converge at all? Yes, they did uh, to some extent. I mean, one of the things that I suppose my, my essay is about is laziness. Um, and uh, Bart himself was somebody who, who was quite interested in his own laziness and his, in his own capacity for, for boredom. I was fantastically bored at school. And one of the things that, that Bart saved me from uh, was, was, was simply having nothing else in, in my life. You know, that I discovered through him all kinds of realms of, uh, of literature. Um, at college, I went to college in the, the late 80s, early 90s. And at that point, a writer like Bart would have been taught uh, very much as part of this movement of, of theory that was was being was expanding the realms of, of what it was, the, how it was possible to think about literature. So there were feminist critics and Marxist critics and post-colonial critics and so on. And it was a very kind of fertile time at, at UCD. We had great, great teachers like Seamus Dean, Declan Kybert, Thomas Doherty, who introduced us to all of this. Um, and I absolutely grasped at that. I, you know, I, I thought this, this is at last I found, I found uh, the fulfilment of this adolescent interest um, in, the, in this whole field of philosophy and criticism and so on. Um, at the same time, I think that Bart was always still kind of hovering around uh, in the background because what Bart had was at the same time as this extremely acute and, and, and politically very radical uh, purchase on culture at large and literature in, in particular. At the same time, there was this emotional side to his work that that I kept kind of grasping at, I suppose, that in some way kind of kept me going towards the idea of what I thought I wanted to be, which was an academic, um, because it seemed as if being an academic was the place where you could actually be this kind of writer, a writer who was who was attentive to literature in, a, in, in quite a profound way, but could also write about popular culture, um, and could write about himself at the same time. That um, that ambition to be a, an academic, uh, you embarked on a PhD, and what happened? I took seven years to write it uh, instead of three. 
Um, I started a PhD in Dublin and very rapidly, I think, lost my way. I mean, one of the things that the essay is about is uh, is losing your way as a, as a postgraduate student. I think it, it happens a lot. You're, you're simply kind of cast into this void, really, you and the library. And um, But the, at the same time, the other thing that, that gradually dawned on me, I think, was that it wasn't really possible to be the kind of writer I'd imagined that being an academic could make you. A writer like Bart, who who was who was a public intellectual, but and but was also a writer who was who was very much kind of thinking about about the the pleasure of his own text. You know, the, he he wanted to entertain his uh, his reader as well as as instruct. And so I rather lost my way um, in academia, moved to uh, the UK um, to Canterbury in '95 with the intention of finishing in a year. I somehow thought I could I could redeem myself um, and finish this, this thesis, um, and I spent that year, that first year, writing absolutely nothing. In fact, um, but I do remember a moment, um, sort of halfway through that year, uh, of talking to friends very late at night and and saying, you know, actually I got into this to do something else. It's not this this what this profession that we seem to be um, kind of uh, moving ourselves towards very very slowly, is not really what what we had in mind. And I think it was at that moment that it's, it dawned on me that, that possibly academia was not, after all, the place where you could be that kind of writer. So maybe in a sense, a year spent not writing is is good training uh, for somebody who, who will become a writer. And you, you have moved into that much more personal kind of writing, um, especially with your memoir of a few years back in the dark room, which I think you'd say could not have been written without your intense reading of Bart over the years, especially his later work. Tell me about, again, that influence, that inspiration from Bart. Well, In the Dark Room is a, is a book that um, I actually had a kind of inkling of uh, in the late 90s. And in the wake of having kind of failed academically, um, I, uh, in around 97 or so, was extremely depressed and really wondering if I would ever, um, if I'd ever gain any sort of employment, never mind academic. And somehow into my mind came this idea for a book um, and a book that started from a very personal experience, which was the experience of losing both of my parents when I was quite young, my mother when I was 16 and my dad when I was 21. And the idea came to me really in an image and it was the image of my mother's hands. She suffered from a very rare autoimmune disease and rather than try to tell the story from start to finish of her experience or of my childhood I wanted in a way that was very much kind of inspired by Bart's attention to detail um, to start with a detail, to start with something quite tactile and physical and so the book really is I suppose it's almost this kind of inventory of of these little moments um, of things to do with my mother's body, um, belongings of my father's, photographs in particular. And Bart, of course, wrote uh, his very his last book, his Camera Lucida, his great book about photography, which is also a book about his mother. Um, and so I would have to admit absolutely that my memoir uh, is completely indebted um, to Bart's way of writing about his own mother at the end of his his own life. Was it? hard for you to, to write about the deaths of, of your parents? It was hard in the sense that it was hard to write. Um, and I suppose, I mean, that's a question that, that any memoirist is going to be asked. Um, I think that by the time I'd actually figured out how to write this book, the, the problem at hand was the writing, you know, was, was the language, was doing justice uh, to thoughts and ideas and feelings that I'd already formulated, I think. Maybe you'd read us an, an extract from from that book in the dark room. My parents are sitting in the corner of the room, side by side, on a pair of ancient and, I recall, extremely uncomfortable armchairs that have been pushed together so that they're close enough for my father to put his right arm around my mother's shoulder. His hand stretches towards her upper arm, but only his fingertips rest on the fabric of her blouse, as if any more insistent touch might injure her frail body. The gesture is quite unfamiliar to me. There is only one other photograph in which he reaches out to her like this. My father sits stiffly in his chair. I have the impression that he is ill at ease with this now unaccustomed ritual of the photograph. His faint smile is a touch too strained. He looks as though he has had to will himself to project even this modest sign of his assurance before the camera. 
although I know that he's not yet aware of the precise seriousness of my mother's current condition. I cannot help wondering if he has guessed that this will be their last photograph together. That certainty, I now know, is for him only a matter of days away. Again, I think um, there's a particular book of Barthes that was very influential in, in the writing of this. I suppose that, that, that photographic quality, that, that very strong visual sense in what you've just read. Yes, well, one of the things that, um, that Barthes writes about brilliantly in, in his last book on, on photography um, is the f- trying to find through these images, becoming obsessed by images of, of his mother after she died. And he tries to find the, the, the photograph that will, will encapsulate her, that will be absolutely the right, the just image of the person he has lost. And he calls this, in this, this fantastic phrase, um, the impossible science of the unique being. And he finds it, or he thinks he's found it, in a photograph of his mother aged five, taken um, in the late 19th century. And she's in a greenhouse or a winter garden. And he doesn't reproduce the photograph in the book. Um, and in a kind of homage to Barth, the, the photograph that I've just uh, described, this photograph of my, the last photograph of, of my parents, doesn't actually appear in the book because it seems like something that you want to, to hold back. You're reading that account of you as, a, I suppose, a slightly lost youngster, and there are many young people lost or adrift in their teens. Do you think it, it might have made a difference to you to have studied philosophy at secondary school the way students do in France, for instance? Um, and is that something we should maybe think about as a society, introducing young people to a broad spectrum of philosophical thought early on? Well, absolutely, yes, I think so. I think so. Um, I think that um, it would not necessarily have done me any good in the sense that um, I think the exposure is is, is what matters. Um, I think... I personally, as a, you know, as a, as a school student and, a, and a, as a university student, reacted very badly to prescription, you know, to, to, to having um, to having works of, of literature uh, or, or um, to being forced to read things, essentially. And if one were to do that, you know, if you're introdu- to, to introduce people to these great thinkers, um, I think it would have to be in a way that allows for the essential curiosity and kind of vagrancy and and unpredictableness of the adolescent mind. Um, I think otherwise, you know, something as unpredictable and as extraordinary as the writing of Roland Barthes would become just another part of the the academic sausage machine, really. Um, Your own writing then, I suppose, um, a little like Barthes, the writing has taken you towards fiction um, and You've made the leap with a work of fiction that's that's coming out soon. Tell me about that. It's a very short work of fiction. It's a novella, I guess, um, rather old-fashioned form. Um, it's called Sanctuary, and it's a story about a place. Um, it's a story about a ruin, um, a ruin of a 1960s seminary. Um, it's set in Scotland. It's based on a real building, but it had, there's a story, a story of the, the disappearance of somebody and... Um, and his partner going to try and find, not even to try and find, but to explore this this place. Um, it's the first piece of fiction that I've ever written, um, so it's somewhat nerve-wracking. Um, interestingly, Bart, the last one of the last things that Bart ever worked on, um, was a plan, a project for a novel, which he never wrote. He wrote only four or five pages of this thing, but he taught a whole course, which has recently been published, um, on the desire to write a novel. Um, and so, in a way, my my effort at fiction is is partly a kind of again a kind of homage to to Barth. I'm quite I'm, I'm interested in the desire to write a novel. Whether it actually comes off as as a successful piece of fiction is is entirely another matter. And when will that nove- novel novella sanctuary be out? That will be out this May. Brian Dillon, thanks very much.